Canadians are saying that while multiculturalism is overall a net benefit, they'd like to see more integration. Is multiculturalism failing? Do we even have multiculturalism? But if you give them the opportunity, they will prosper. They will prosper and can will benefit. Multiculturalism is, is part of us. The myth of multiculturalism in a global world where do people from other countries fit into the mosaic of Canada that is continually expanding? Canada is a nation of welcomers, but newcomers, refugees, even first-generation Canadians feel an incredible reluctance from institutions and some people when it comes to trying to get ahead in our prosperous and beautiful land. Today on the program, Shachi Curl, President of Angus Reid is here, United Nations Resettlement Officer Michael Casasola, and Kaliani Thuraja each explain the hope that is in multiculturalism when we erase racism. Indigenous leader Susan Levi Peter weighs in, and media professional Ola Adebayo talks with Maggie about making it as a newcomer in the tough world of Canadian media. Today on Context, we ask, is multiculturalism a myth or are we on the right track to fixing things when it comes to the boundaries that immigrants face daily in our Canadian-made systems? Sachi Curl is the president of the Angus Reid Institute, a job that calls her to educate Canadians on a number of different issues. Today, she is here to help us understand Canada as a multicultural nation. Now, Sachi, in 1971, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, announced multiculturalism as a policy. Do you think we still adhere to that policy, or is it more the spirit of the policy that exists today? It's a complication because you do find that a significant number of Canadians will look to our multiculturalism and our inclusivity and those official practices and as net benefits. But at the same time, one constant and chronic thread you hear, whether someone is uh, from uh, a cultural uh, and a, a multicultural background or it, whether they're an immigrant or first generation or second generation, is that there is a desire to see perhaps a little bit more melting, which is uh, more the, the um, approach of the United States, where of course it's a melting pot. Canada in the early years of official multiculturalism referred to itself as more of a mosaic, something more pixelated. But what we find now through polling that we do at the Angus Reid Institute is that you do see a desire really um, almost across the board for people to say, yes, we want Canadians to hold on to their cultural heritage. We want them to hold on to the cultural markers that they hold dear. But we also want, particularly around language, uh, there, there is a desire among Canadians to see uh, greater use of uh, one or both official languages in this country and a desire to see uh, immigrants or newcomers to the country doing more to uh, fit in. That's, that's the language or the terminology used. So, um, you know, we're always searching for uh, a more perfect society. In this case, I think what we find is that Canadians are saying that while multiculturalism is overall a net benefit, they'd like to see more integration as well. I think that is something that has um, been fairly consistent over the years. That's I find that fascinating, Sachi. So more assimilation, more cohesiveness, um, as opposed to this individualized uh, society, which I find interesting. Now, you believe that immigrants and refugees are essential to Canada. Tell me why. Well, Canadians believe that. So again, in terms of the data that we find, uh, Canadians believe that immigration is overall something that's required and needed. And let's face it, uh, we don't have enough babies in this country to, cre to fill the jobs that are going to need to be filled in 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. So immigration, unless we, we become more like Japan and just embark on full mechanization of everything and robotization of everything, Canada needs immigrants in order to keep uh, our society running the way we like it running. Um, immigration is something that from an economic point of view is necessary. But again, uh, the data show that there is quite a bit of 
um, a misunderstanding around who's coming into the country, where they're coming from, and why they're coming. So we did a pretty comprehensive study on immigration in 2019, not too long ago, that found uh, Canadians vastly, vastly overestimate the number of immigrants coming into the country from being from the Middle East. Uh, that's a direct I think interpretation or correlation to the the number of landings they saw from Syrian refugees on the on the six o'clock news every night for a while in in 2015 and 2016. In fact, most immigrants to the country are coming from places like China, India, the Philippines, the United States, South America. I think another common misperception is that Canadians believe that most people coming into the country as immigrants are coming from that refugee class or family reunification class. In fact, we have one of the strictest immigration systems in the Western world. Uh, most of our immigrants are coming in educated, qualified to work, ready to work, and they have good job outcomes as a result. A lot of foreign students who come to the country have a pathway to immigration. Again, they have a level of qualification. I don't know that that's something that most Canadians actually know about or realize. So I think communication around who comes, why they come yeah. is a big part of whether people understand or support immigration in general, and then the, the societal impacts such as multiculturalism that come with it. Okay, thank you so much, Sachi Curl from the Angus Reid Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today. Many Canadians pride themselves on multiculturalism being part of our national identity. But what does that word really mean? And is harmony among so many different cultures possible? Well, Professor Kiliani Thuraja is here to explain. Thank you so much, Kiliani, for being here today. Now, you say multiculturalism is a myth. Is it? And why? I don't say it's a myth as in it's completely impossible. Um, or outside the realm of possibility, but I think it is a myth in that we haven't actually developed a universal definition for the term, which is what leads to a lot of people then feeling like, is multiculturalism failing? Do we even have multiculturalism? Or on the other side saying, yes, this is multicultural when in fact it is not. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We need to understand the definition of multiculturalism. Now, many people hear multiculturalism and assume this means equality. What needs to change in order to understand fully what multiculturalism means? I think before we can fully understand what multiculturalism means, we need to understand what it is not. Mm. Uh, sometimes the assumption with multiculturalism is that everything goes, uh, and everyone can practice what they want in terms of their culture. They can speak whatever language they want as if we've created a society with all of these silos. But that's not what multiculturalism, at least in a Canadian context, is supposed to mean. It's supposed to mean that when people are coming in, no matter where they're coming from, no matter what their cultural values are, they have a place here. And those cultural values are going to be celebrated for the diversity it brings while they're also expected to integrate into whatever it means to be Canadian. The issue is, of course, that Canadians struggle, um, as opposed to our counterparts, our neighbors to the South, in terms of defining what it means to be Canadian in the first place. So sometimes then, when people are um, practicing varying culture, cultural values, we say, oh, you're not being Canadian. And they say, but I thought being Canadian meant that I could do that, which is what leads to that tension about whether or not multiculturalism is a success or a failure. Yeah. In your estimation, what would you say? Is multiculturalism a success or a failure in this country? I, uh, despite the fact that I study uh, things like multiculturalism and racism, I am an optimist. So I'd like to believe that it could be a success. I don't think in its current form it is a success. And the reason for that is because here in Canada, we don't like to talk about the fact that we do have an identity. And if we could just come out and say, this is what it means to be Canadian, then we would have an easier time recognizing when people are being oppositional to that or not. Yeah. But because we don't clearly articulate what it means, uh, we 
start to get upset when we think that all of these other people and these other groups are celebrating their cultures, but what about ours? And of course, then the question is, well, what is your culture? What does it mean to be Canadian? Tell me what it means before you tell me that I'm not being Canadian enough. Yeah. What would you say is the relationship between racism then and multiculturalism or just the struggle to understand what true multiculturalism looks like? I think uh, often people see those things as if they are mutually exclusive. So if there is multiculturalism, there cannot be racism. If there is racism, then clearly there is no multiculturalism. And the truth is that that is not the case. Um, racism exists when there is fear um, and discrimination against those who are different from you. Right? So we can celebrate things like having samosas and sushi and say how multicultural we are while still being racist against Indians who make those samosas and Japanese Canadians who create those sushis for us. So oftentimes people think that because we're so multicultural, we cannot be racist, but that is um, not at all the case. Can you also explain the difference between multiculturalism and interculturalism? Yes, so there are some countries and Quebec as our province who have rejected multiculturalism because they believe that multiculturalism doesn't have a strong enough center and it equally prioritizes all groups and all values. And they say, well, no, that's not the case. There is a center here and we want people to come in and adopt some of those central values while being able to maintain their own. So interculturalism has a, a centralized um, set of values that are also supposed to be prioritized more than anything else. Um, multiculturalism doesn't like to explicitly talk about the center. So it suggests that all of these groups are equal, which upsets certain um, societies, especially societies that have very strong traditions, have a very clear sense of who they are, what they stand for, what their cultural beliefs and values are. And they don't want other groups coming in and saying, well, my values and beliefs are just as important as yours in this society. All right. I feel like I just sat in one of your lectures or in your classroom. Thank you so much, Professor Kalyani Thuraja, for your time today. Newcomers to Canada can fall under various categories from refugees to migrants to immigrants. Michael Casasola from the UN Refugee Agency is here to explain more. Thanks so much, Michael, for being here today. Now, let's start with the basics. What is the difference between a refugee and an immigrant? Well, um, I mean, the terms are often thrown around casually by us, and, and I understand why. I mean, for example, when people fled the fires in and uh, Fort McMurray referred, they were sometimes referred to as refugees, but these terms have really important meanings in international law. A refugee, I mean, a, a refugee is someone who is fleeing persecution uh, or fleeing war per se, as we commonly see them, as opposed to an immigrant who made the choice to, uh, to go to a new country. So sometimes they're oftentimes grouped together, but it's really important for us this distinction because this idea that a refugee was forced to flee as opposed to an immigrant who chooses to make the decision. This is the key distinction, and there's a whole area of international law based in all of this. Okay. What vital role do refugees and immigrants fill in our societies? Well, I mean, first, in, in Canada, it's been really interesting because as in, as for UNHCR, I mean, we promote the protection of refugees. That is our mandate. And we would if we approach a country like Canada and say, you know, we remind them of responsibilities in terms of which Canada complies with to pr provide protection for refugees. So that's often, the re that is the reason that they're allowed to admit, be admitted to the country. But what's been really interesting in the Canadian experience has been that Canada has not just provided protection for refugees by allowing them to come here and, and become permanent residents and become citizens, but the Canada in the end has actually benefited from this experience. One of the interesting things when you look at the last census data is that refugees are found to have comparable unemployment rates as Canadians or employment rates uh, on the other side, which is really interesting because if you look at, and this is pre-COVID stats, but if you look at refugees who have come within the last 25 years compared to the Canadian population unemployment rates, which at the time of the study was about 6%, for refugees it's about 9%. 
But that was including people who had just arrived, who still didn't speak the language, who still hadn't found their way in the communities, as well as people who've been here for, for decades. And so one of the really interesting things is you see them year after year after year, that the situation of refugees in Canada gets better. I don't want to suggest it's easy, but it, it does get better. And, it, and it's not just in areas of economic integration. We tend to talk about economic integration because one, there's always this question of, you know, what does it cost us? This is, we know is one of the most common concerns about admission of refugees, but also it's one of the things that's easiest to count independently. You know, it's hard to deal with intangibles like, you know, our community benefits from them because of cultural diversity and such. But we do know that other needs Canada has, for example, is demographics. And that refugees are on average younger and have larger families than the average Canadian family, something that also benefits us. We know, I, as much as I talked about that year over year improvement, one of the things that we know also works well in the Canadian context is that if you allow refugees to integrate, if you welcome to integrate, if you take an approach to support, can benefits. One area we're seeing that is the area of education. Refugee children who arrive, come to Canada as refugees have actually better graduation rates of, from high school, from college, from university, and from postgraduate than Canadian born kids. And that's not to say that somehow refugee kids are smarter than Canadian kids. But if you give them the opportunity, they will prosper. They will prosper and Canada will benefit as a result. And, and just starting going in on about this, but I, one last point I would add is that refugees also show have been, if you welcome them, if you encourage this integration, then they will embrace your country, embrace Canada. And that's what Canada's experience. Um, refugees have the highest, uh, highest citizenship rate of any immigrant group that comes to Canada, but also in a poll that was asking about affinity to Canada, 92% of Canadians said they felt attached to Canada, whereas 95% of refugees said they felt attached to Canada. Wow. So again, if you extend that, then refugees will, will take that, take those opportunities up. All right, Michael Casasola from the UN Refugee Agency, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Coming up, the importance of honoring Indigenous heritage and the role it plays in First Nations people with former Elsa Puktuk First Nation Chief Susan Levi Peters. Like to watch more context beyond the headlines? Catch up on any of our shows online. On YouTube, search Context Beyond the Headlines for the most up to date episodes and extended content. Listen on the go with Apple, Spotify, or Google Podcast. Check out our reporters' and producers' stories at our website, context.show. Follow us on Instagram at Context Beyond the Headlines and Twitter at Context TV. There are so many ways to put more context into your life. Many Indigenous people have had their heritage stripped from them through residential schools and other forms of colonization. Some do not know family members or where they came from. Former Elsa Puktuk First Nation Chief Susan Levi Peters is with me now for an important conversa conversation. Thanks so much, Susan, for joining us today. Now, Canada is known for its diversity of cultures, but we see all around us broken treaties, broken promises, even hate it, hatred between cultures. Where do you think this brokenness comes from? It comes from um, our history. Like, we don't know um, our identities because the Canadian history is different than our history that's passed down to us. Like in the Canadian history, uh, we're more the villains or, or so our identity uh, is kind of, um, are we the villains? And in our, in our culture, uh, in us, our, our upbringing, um, we are the heroes. So, it, it, it can get confusing, I think, and it has a lot to do with the, with the history. So Susan, what makes you feel positive about the stories of First Nations people in Canada and, and the identity that you want to hold on to and who you are? As a First Nation person, uh, our history has been told by non-Natives mm -hmm. and it has been told as if we were the villains. So when we go to school, uh, to non-native schools, that's what we're taught. But when at home, our history is different because we are the peacekeepers. We have never, um, uh, as Mi'kmaq, if you do research, like proper research, and when you talk to our elders, uh, we were always the peacekeepers. And we were always, uh, we have peace and friendship treaties with Canada. 
uh, our door was, uh, is always open. So we've, we've been uh, multicultures and is, is part of us, is who we are. And if it wasn't for multiculturalism, I wouldn't be sitting here because my grandmother is French, so, you know. That's such, a, that's such a beautiful point to highlight that First Nations, there are so many identities within First Nations that make it cult multicultural on so many levels. Last question, Susan, for you. What does Canada need to understand in order to embrace that multiculturalism that you know the indigenous community brings and so many other uh, ethnic communities bring to our country? Uh, they need to understand that we are an asset, not a liability, and that we need to, uh, every culture and every nation has their own unique, um, own, own unique traditions. And if we embrace every one of them, you'll realize that we all have uh, one creator. We all have love. We all have hope, you know? So um, it, it, what Canada needs to do is, is not be afraid, not to be afraid of First Nation people, to embrace them. All right, beautifully said. Thank you again, Susan Levi Peters, for your time today. Thank you, Maggie. My next guest story is one that many newcomers to this country can identify with. Ola Adebayo was a media professional in his home country of Nigeria. The barriers he faces here in Canada to do the same work are challenging. So Ola, when you arrived in Canada being a media professional back home, what were your expectations or hopes for your uh, profession here in Canada? Did you think you'd just be able to jump right back into it? Yeah, absolutely. I felt with my experience, I've had more than 15 years experience doing pro possibly everything you can ever do in the media from uh, doing news reporting to um, producing commercials, producing large venue events and all of that. I felt my experience will make way for me easily. But you didn't have that experience. You hit a number of barriers, boundaries. The truth about it is that at some point it was depressing. <laughs> it was depressing. I came to Canada and I found these two uh, phrases, if we will call it that, Canadian experience, Canadian education. And for me, it was an oxymoron. The key thoughts behind Canadian immigration policy was about the fact that there is a gap uh, that needs to be filled in terms of um, the a generation was going away, they were retiring. Some of them were transiting and they needed some of those guys coming in to fill the space. But I found out that that wasn't the case, especially in my profession. Um, I tried several things. I went back to school. Okay, they wanted Canadian education. I did a year to in a, a structure that the government had designed to train international professionals. Uh, I did that. I had a little stint in work experience as a journalism. And I felt like, yeah, I checked all the boxes and now I should be able to go. Uh, but here am I, more than two years after, um, I had to change strategy. I thought after leaving the media, I went to say, okay, I have a lot of business analysis, uh, project management experiences. The funny thing was that I got in front of management. I got to talk to VPs. And they were like, whoa, how did you put all these experiences together? Oh, you did this, you did that. And, but at the end of the day, there will just be one film, filmsy excuse to edge me out of the process. So it's been a wall. In your experience here in Canada, have you seen uh, this country fulfilling its multicultural mandate? I've seen multiculturalism. Um, I remember when I came in, I lived downtown. Oh, oh boy, my kids didn't want to leave downtown, you know. Everybody, uh, there is this event that talks about uh, different cultures, Canadians trying to make you see their own part of the culture and all of that. But I think it ends on the streets. And if I take it one more level, I think with the people, uh, at least to a large number, but when it comes to the key organ that should entrench those things. 
it doesn't go that far. The structures of government that the government has put in place is not making it work. Now, it's, it's two parts, the government and probably the employers themselves. So, and those are the two main organs, public and private sector, that can really, really, really make sure that there is diverse culture in the workplaces, uh, especially because of what immigration policy is all about. But that's not the case. I think all those structures are there, but I think the sincerity of the government is questionable when it comes to making sure some of these policies doesn't end in some of the things they have uh, developed and designed and put funds in to making it a reality. I absolutely think it's a lot of waste of time and resources mm. on both parts, on my part and government part. And so you find yourself in jobs that where you are overqualified. Yeah, absolutely. I find myself at, a t at, at this time doing a, a fulfillment associate job in a grocery center, for instance, you know. Uh, I designed it to work at night so I can do my uh, journalism skill during the day. You know, like I said, I, what I just did was that I just thought that nothing should stop me. So I changed strategy. I decided to create my own job. What makes you still determined to not give up and still call Canada home? Media, journalism, uh, using that instrument to, to make the world a better place has been my life, lifelong passion. And as a matter of fact, what this challenge did for me was that it made me find my voice. So I decided that, you know what, and I'm going to be a voice for the kind of people that I represent, really. And I decided to say, you know what, I'm African black. So let me start telling the stories of Africans that are black in Canada. Since I've been doing that, I, I launched a podcast. I started blogging, uh, doing video blogs on YouTube, you know, uh, telling the story of Africans, telling the whole story about uh, who we are and uh, a story that seems contrary to what you see on mainstream media, especially in the West. So that's what I've filled my time with and it's been motivational for me. It helped me get out of my depressed state when I found out that I might never be able to work in any Canadian uh, broadcast station. Thank you so much, Ola. You're welcome. We've learned a lot about multiculturalism today, and yet there are still so many unanswered questions. As a child of immigrants, a first-generation Canadian, I have personally witnessed the struggles my parents and relatives have had to live through in order to provide a future for their children. And while if you ask many immigrants and refugees, they would say they are proud to call Canada home. But there is a reality we need to wrestle with. How do we make this country more than just a destination? but a place of belonging for all. Thanks for watching Context today. For all of us here, I'm Maggie John.